worship team. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. So wonderful seeing all of you enjoying each other, hugging, greeting each other, just appreciating the privilege to be in the company of one another. And I know we can do this for a long time. And I want you to just keep that light, pleasurable attitude. We've already greeted Jesus. Amen. We've already told him how much we care about him and how thankful we are for his presence in our lives. And we're not going to stop doing that. We're going to continue. As we come together this morning, I want to say happy Sunday. You know, and I want to welcome all of you that are here in this presence and all of you that are presently joining us online for worship. Well, it's good to be back here at Grace Christian Family Church in South Florida in general. Yeah, my family and I were on vacation, had a nice vacation. You know, we ate good food. Paul asked me this morning how much weight I gained. I told him five pounds. He doesn't believe me. Well, you know, this good food was accompanied by visiting some very exciting places. We went different states and had a great time. And although our time was wonderful for the food and the places we visited, the thing that really made my vacation special was the people I was sharing it with. I was sharing it with my family, my loved ones, and my friends. And, you know, I'm glad I'm in your presence today, back in town, back at my home church, because the company you're amongst makes a big difference. Wouldn't you agree? Well, then tell your neighbor, I'm glad you're here. And if you're a believer, I know you're glad that the Lord is here in our midst. Amen. Amen. Now, let's continue worshiping him with our study today in his word. And today, the title of our message is PPP. Yeah, PPP. Now, I'm not talking about the PPP loan. You know, Miss Debbie's familiar with that, also known as the Paycheck Protection Program loan. This was offered by the United States government in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as part of this, many of you may know that this relief that came in March 2020 had a lot of benefits. Here are some quick overviews. The purpose of the PPP loan was to provide financial assistance to small businesses, nonprofit organizations, self-employed individuals, and it helped them to weather some of the adverse effects of the pandemic. It offered three main things, loan forgiveness, it had eligibility requirements, and favorable terms. Now, you know, you might be thinking, what does this have to do with worshiping God? Well. The PPP I'm talking about is presence, pleasure, and power. You see, this PPP offers forgiveness of sins. And all one needs to be eligible for this PPP is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and call on his name. And the terms, people, are very favorable. The term is eternal life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in his presence forever. So this morning, we will read from a psalm of David. In Psalm 16, David opens up with a prayer. How many people know that we need prayer? We need to pray to God. So he opens up with this prayer in the first sentence. His prayer to the Lord is to preserve me. <laughs> now, that's a prayer we all need. The rest of the chapter consists of David testifying about his past, present, and future confidence in God's Ability to preserve him. You know, with all his heart, remember David said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And he was demonstrating this. So I want you to stand with me 
as we read our main passage in Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. Now, if you're ready, I want to hear you say present. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show the way, way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Amen. You may be seated. Now, Psalm 16 is categorized as a mitkum of David. You know, many authors wrote the Psalms, and the ones that um, indicate David wrote it, um, this is the term that's used. And although the circumstances aren't known as far as why he read this or why he wrote this and when he wrote this, you know, many scholars believe that he wrote this during a time of distress and danger. You know, we go through those sometimes, right? Nonetheless, the contents of the psalm are always applicable, whether you're on the mountaintop right now, whether you're in the valley. As believers, we are to deepen our dependence and trust in the Lord. Now, verse 8 says, I know the Lord is always with me, always with me. You know, Patrick testified to that as we, we sang in praise and worship t this morning. And the Bible recounts several instances where the Lord was with David. Remember, David was called a man after God's own heart. And he is with David, providing, protecting, and supporting him. So let's look at a few notable examples. I know we're all familiar with this. If you went to Sunday school as a kid, David and Goliath, right? This is one of the well-known stories in the Bible. And it involves an encounter with this Philistine giant. I mean, huge you know, recently they had the number one pick who was 7'4", and Goliath would make him look like a shorty. <laughs> you know, when David volunteered to fight Goliath, just imagine, ready old David, he volunteered to fight this giant. Yeah. And why? Because he was confident that the Lord would be with him. He expressed his confidence in God's presence and assistance. And this was in 1 Samuel 17. And we read that David defeated Goliath. With a bazooka? <laughs> with some nuclear weapons? No, with a stone and a sling. Oh, my God. That's got to be God. You see, the Lord's help enabled David to accomplish this. Here's another example of when the Lord was with David. Remember David's anointing as a king? Remember before he became king, you know, David was anointed by the prophet Samuel. You know, he wasn't like the cream of the crop. He wasn't the one that you would buy your natural eyes pick, but God chose him and he was anointed and the spirit of the Lord was with David, empowering him to be the future king. Here's another example. Remember the other king, Saul? Remember how he had to be delivered from Saul? You see, King Saul became jealous of David's military success and popularity. And what happened? He wanted to kill David. He wanted to take David out. However, through this period, the Lord protected David, and he repeatedly intervened on his behalf. He spared his life multiple times. Now, let's not forget about all of David's successful battles. You know, Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands, right? Remember the Lord granted David victories in numerous campaigns like against the Philistines? the Ammonites, the Moabites, and other enemies of Israel. You see, all the ites, right? These successes, they're attributed to the presence and the favor of the Lord. And then finally, the establishment of the Davidic covenant. In 2 Samuel 2, the Lord made a covenant with David, promising to establish his dynasty and ensure that one of his descendants would sit on the throne forever. And one of his descendants, the root of David, sits on the throne both now and forevermore. You see, this demonstrated God's ongoing presence and favor toward David and his lineage. P number one, in the presence of God is where Christians are instructed, counseled, and guided. You see, David made a lifestyle to be in the presence of the Lord. 
He pursued God's presence in his triumphs and in his failures. Because of this, he was protected, instructed, counseled, and guided, as we see in many of the Bible accounts. We could say more, but we understand how God's presence protected David. Now, his predecessor, King Saul, he plotted another course. We see in the Bible that the Lord withdrew his favor and presence from Saul due to his disobedience and his rejection of God's instruction. Saul's downfall began when he disobeyed God's command given through the prophet Samuel. You remember that specific command? God had commanded Saul to completely, completely destroy the Malachites and all their possessions. But he decided to plot his own course. God wanted to wipe them out and wipe out their wickedness. But he spared King Agag and the best of his livestock. He took a little bounty for himself. And this was contrary to God's instruction. And when Saul was confronted by Samuel, he offered excuses, justification, you know, all the heen and han that we sometimes follow ourselves doing. And God's judgment fell upon Saul. God rejected him as king over Israel. And from that point forward, the spirit of the Lord left Saul. And an evil spirit troubled him. Though God withdrew his favor from Saul, he continued to be merciful and patient. He provided many opportunities for him to repent. However, Saul's continued disobedience and departure from his presence ultimately led to his tragic downfall. You see, God is omnipresent, but only those who are connected to him through Jesus are truly in his presence. We can have a room full of people, and God is omnipresent, but that room full of people, only those that are connected to God through Jesus Christ are truly in his presence. John 15, 5 through 6 says, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Ouch. You see, those who are connected to the vine, they're green and growing. But those who are disconnected from the vine, they're withering and waning. We were in the Northeast, had a great vacation, you know, and we got to see a lot of different landscapes. We got to see mountains and hills. Imagine that. You know, in Florida, the biggest hill you'll see is a landfill driving on a turnpike. (laughs) But up north, we took in these sites of these valleys and You know, when you're up on a hill and you get to peer down in all the vegetation, that's a vantage point you don't get down in Florida. I mean, it's it's beautiful. It's unique. And everything was green. I mean, it's the summer. And I used to live up north, so I know that's a stark contrast to what it looks like in the winter. But the vegetation, although it's usually brown during the winter, it was very green. And you know why it's brown during the winter? It's because they don't get enough exposure. They don't feel the presence of the sun, you know, to give it that sustenance that it needs. But thankfully, the vegetation in Florida is green (laughs) year-round, you know, because of that, I'm able to do my gardening. Those of you who know, I love to garden. I love to be outside, you know. Unfortunately, all my mangoes are finished. But, you know, I got some ackee and avocado coming up, and I'm going to have a bountiful crop this year. You know, another thing I have um, is peppers. And look what I did. You know, this might be like, how could you? A gardener would know better. But I ripped off a branch from one of my pepper trees. And there's a little pepper on there. And it still has a little green, but I did it this morning, and it's already turning brown already turning brown. Why? Because it's not connected to the vine. This is my pepper tree. And this, uh, let me test some of you. Do we know what this is? No? 
Are Jamaicans in the house? Huh? No, no, you eat it. Kalalu, Kalalu. And I got some seeds on here. If you want, you can come see me afterwards and start your own little bush. <laughs> but the point is, these branches that have been taken from the vine are withering. They're wilting. They don't have the sustenance that they need. You know, when believers are not in the presence of God, the same thing happens. That's because the presence of God is where believers can receive sustenance. And as a result of getting our sustenance from his presence is joy and pleasure. Wasn't our praise and worship just wonderful this morning? I don't care what you had going on. You know, you had a long, busy Saturday. You know, you might have, you know, I went to see my brother-in-law and he, he said, oh, man, I feel like I have Marlin disease. I'm like, what's that? He's like, I feel like I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm like, what? I mean, you might have some aches and pains going on right now, but even in the midst of that aches, those aches and pains, when we get into the presence of God and worship, our body is lifted, our spirit is raised, and it's just a wonderful thing to be in his presence. Amen? Now, Psalm 1611 says, 11b, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You ever been around some people that, like, drain the energy out of you? They just, like, suck life. It's like they have a vacuum, and it's just like, and that life is just coming out of you. But then you're around some people that, you know, are like a jolt of energy, uh, just boost your system. They lift your spirit, and you're just so glad to be in their presence. I mean, Doc is smiling. Doc is one of those people. You know, we have her in journey groups, so we know she's not perfect. But <laughs> her personality, her spirit, her demeanor just lifts you. She has a bedside manner, and you know, she is a doctor, so, you know, it goes with the territory. Well, it goes with her territory. <laughs> and so, like, people who lift your spirits, people who, when you're in your, their presence, you just... Um, are encouraged, you're edified, you're lifted up. That is a wonderful experience. You know, our son Austin, he's still up north traveling with the members of his football team. You know, it's a sign that you're getting older when, you know, you can drop your son off um, in a state and say, all right, go spend a week um, touring around different colleges. <laughs> you know, I know Samantha and um, Arsenio are going to be like, not doing anything that crazy for a minute, but as they get older, you have the confidence to allow them to spread their wings. So he's spreading his wings. And yesterday he had a football camp at Cornell University, which is in upstate New York. And he sent us a picture of him at the base of this beautiful waterfall. And he's like, man, I'm close to Canada. <laughs> I mean, it's way up there. I didn't realize, you know, that Cornell was that far north. And he sent this picture. And this picture was Gorgeous. I mean, you can just imagine, you know, you see his full body, you see the waterfall in the background, you just see all the different elements of this picture. Just put it in your mind right now. But as breathtaking as the waterfall was, you know the picture that said a thousand words to my wife was the look on my son's face. Because the look was just exuding pleasure and joy in that moment. His face just lit up. It was like the sun was just beaming off of him. Beloved, are our faces and our body lighting up with joy and pleasure from being in the presence of the sun? Well, it should. And from the looks of most of you out there, it is. Bless the Lord. You see, Psalm 69 says, No wonder my heart is glad. And I rejoice. You know, it's easy to rejoice when things are going good. But like the song we sang this morning, you know, whether you're a mover or a shaker and you're moving and shaking, and even when you realize that everything around you is shaking, what did the song say? I'll never be more glad. Because we know that our gladness and our joy is not based on circumstances, but it's based on our relationship with our Lord and Savior. Maybe you're not going through a challenging time right now. Maybe it's all good. But the 
regardless of what situation it is, we ought to always be glad. P2, God's presence fills us with pleasure on the inside that we express to those around us. So Austin is obviously feeling joy from what I described, and he didn't just bottle it up. No, he let it all come out. You know, sometimes teenagers, and especially football players, you know, they have this exterior, you know, they have to keep that, that mug on, uh, you know, that, that look like, yeah, you don't want to mess with me. <laughs> but he just let himself go and allowed it just to just flow through him. Now, if you're not on top of the world right now, maybe you are going through a challenging time. I empathize with you. And I'm not going to tell you to get over it. Who am I to tell you that? But I will humbly remind us that this is only our right now. And this too shall pass. And even though our right now feels like it will go on forever, and it has been going on forever, remember that we find pleasure in knowing that our forever is right. Our forever is right. Even now, even when you're going through, even when you don't feel like it, because we have to testify like David to our souls. In you know, Revelation 21.4, this is such good news. It says, he will wipe away, he will wipe every tear from your eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. You know, this is a testimony of what is to come in heaven. And if we embrace Matthew 6.10, we can possess the pleasure of what's to come in whatever our present situation is. Matthew 6.10 says, may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Is it because we can just shake off the stuff that we're going through? Is it because we can medicate ourselves with chocolate? <laughs> or, <laughs> or a round of golf? Or a nice steak off the grill? I'm stepping on past Mike's toes now. <laughs> no, that isn't why. It's because God pleasure, and I didn't say God's pleasure, God pleasure, the type of pleasure that God provides, it transcends carnal pleasure. That's what enables us to be able to do that. You see, God pleasure is not superficial. It's supernatural. Now, if you look all around, we've been to stores, see it on the TV, our neighbor, social media feeds. You know, everyone appears to be having the time of their lives. They're living their best life. They're projecting all these images of just being in their glory. They present this best version of themselves, and some people believe it. But people try and mask their deep displeasures. You know, there are a lot of people with deep displeasures. And apart from God, we all have deep displeasures. Displeasure with our possessions, with our status in life, our physical state, this pleasure that we try to mask or cover up with carnal pleasures. But meanwhile, you know what's going on inside the core? We're displeased. We're separated. We're not having a pleasurable time. In our core, we feel awful. We feel this strong sense of displeasure that we try to cover up. Why is that? Well, God wired all of us a certain way. We're all wired a certain way. And he wired us a certain way because we are created in his image. And he wants us to be like him. You see, God's pleasure, or God pleasure rather, it penetrates. It penetrates deep into our core being. And then it emanates from those who are in his presence. Let's listen to the English Standard Version of Psalm 69. Therefore, my heart is glad, 
and my whole being rejoices. My flesh dwells secure. Three components to who we are here. It says, my heart is glad. This is a reference to the core being of who David is. And he, like all of us, were created in God's image. And that's the essence of who you are. It is. To use a computer term, our heart is like our kernel. It's deep embedded, deeply embedded in there. So that's my heart. Then it talks about my whole being rejoices. That points to our soul, which is our mind, our emotions, and our will. And to use another computer term, this is the interface, interface that we use to present and commune with God and others around us. And then finally it says, my flesh also dwells secure. You know, sometimes as we were walking in the streets of New York and, you know, my comfortable shoes are working, but I didn't have any shoes on my knees. You know, my knees were just trying to give out on me. You know, my flesh was not secure. <laughs> but it says, my flesh also dwells secure. This describes the vessel that houses our heart and our soul. The Apostle Paul referred to it as a tent in 1 Corinthians 5.1. And although it will be dismantled one day, you ever been camping and love the time you had, and then comes that day where you got to pack up all the tenting equipment. There's going to be a time where we're going to have to pack up all the tenting equipment. But that's going to be a glorious day. That's going to be a glorious day. So let us be glad and rejoice knowing we are secure in Christ. Now tell your neighbor in your best Chick-fil-A voice, my pleasure. You see, why is it our pleasure? Because we get the opportunity to testify to others. Amen? And this is a blessing to others, but guess what? It also benefits us. It aids our ability to be proficient in practicing the presence and the pleasure of God. David demonstrates this in Psalm 16. He demonstrates how we can build confidence and trust in the Lord. He knows that our testimony and our connection with the Lord builds confidence. It builds confidence. You ever seen a confident person, not a cocky person, not a person who's, you know, full of themselves, but a person who's confident because they have trust in the work that they've put in. They have trust in the source that they're relying on. They have trust that they've done the homework, did the necessary work, and have come prepared. You ever seen a confident person, you know, how that differs? You know, imagine when Miss Valerie went in for an interview. She was confident because she prepared. I know she crosses all the I's and dots all the T's. She's very meticulous. So when we're confident, we're able to perform and present ourselves much better. Do you agree? And why was David confident? Was it because he had a slingshot that couldn't miss? No. It was because he was trusting in the Lord. Unlike Saul, David persisted in trusting in the Lord to show him the way of life. You see, Saul started off on the right path. He did. But then he veered away. His decision to disobey God and not remain in the Lord, it cost him dearly. It cost him his kingdom. And if he did listen to the Lord, he would have had a much more fruitful life. So, beloved, I encourage you, let us not make the same mistake. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, we get an opportunity to testify for others' benefit, and it helps us to, to grow our confidence. And you see, our testimony and our connection with the Lord builds confidence. We got to talk about what God has done in our lives. We have to stay connected to the Lord. That was the point, by the way, confidence. We have to be ready and able to demonstrate what God's doing in our lives. We have to be ready with an answer for what we believe, right? Yes. Amen. You see, Psalm 1611 says, you will show me the way of life. You know, I've been um, driving, I don't know how many miles, 
over this past week. And I used my GPS, you know, because I wasn't necessarily familiar. But even with my GPS, you know, I still got that guy code where, you know, I'm trying to find my way. My wife's like, you want me to plug it in? Ah, I got it. I remember which way we came. <laughs> but sometimes as a guy, we have this problem with asking for directions. You know, we don't need it. No, I got it. I'm good. But we don't have to take that approach with God. He wants us to ask him for help. And the best part about it, he has all the answers. He has all the answers. You will show me the way of life. That's what it says in verse 11. P number three, the power of God is available to us as we remain in him. Acts 2.28 says, you have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. You see, the way to life is a way of life. This is something that we're to persist in, like David. This isn't a one and done. This isn't. I've got it. You know, there are many people in professions that, you know, feel they have attained and they can't take advice or any sort of input from anyone else because they figure they know it all. We will never know it all as a believer. We will never reach. We'll be like that commercial. Are we there yet? No. One day we will be, praise be to God, but it's a continual journey for us to keep asking him to show us the way of life, to lead us in the past that we should go. You know, the Bible says in John 15, 7 through 8, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Power. Power. When we're in God's presence and taking pleasure in it, delighting ourselves in the Lord, we have power. You know, when we were on vacation, I visited the John F. Kennedy Library and Museum, and we saw many exhibits and several documentaries, and one of the documentaries we watched was about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And as I watched this depiction of history, you know, and as you're going on family trips and going to museums, you know, because you want to be exposed to that stuff and you want your kids to be exposed to that stuff. But when you watch those documentaries, it's a great time to take a quick nap. <laughs> I love it. It's air conditioned there. The lights are out. They don't know what's going on. <laughs> but I did pick up one key thing when they were showing this documentary about the Cuban Missile Crisis. I noticed that here you had two powerful men, President Kennedy and the Russian leader Nikita Khrushchev. Powerful men who had the power to prevent or propel the countries that they serve into nuclear war. I mean, that's power. That's power. But that's temporal power. Beloved, I want you to know that you have eternal power. Eternal power. And guess what that eternal, ultimate power that we all possess is? Anyone can tell me? What is that ultimate, eternal power that we have? The Holy Spirit. But why do we have the Holy Spirit? Is it to make our lives better? That's a byproduct. Is it to share the gospel? That's a function. But ultimately... The power that we have is to bring glory to God. Yes, that's our superpower. And how do we get the superpower? When we practice being in God's presence and taking pleasure in his ways. The key is being in God's presence. You know, I had this, um, or you've heard it. I can't say I had this, but, you know, G.I. Joe, right? Showing up is half the battle, right? Being, being there, you know, being ready. That's half the battle right there. And there's definitely some truth 
to that. But while we're there, we have to practice the presence of God. We can't be going through the motions in church. Man, what is it doing? Going to stop talking? It's not me that's talking. I'm a vessel that's being used. And regardless of who is talking, if we allow the Holy Spirit to give us discernment and to pick pick from what's being said, we can be edified. So we're we're always able to be in the presence. We're always to be consciously and deliberately seeking God's presence. So what does it mean to to be practicing the presence of God? Well, it may not appear in the Bible verbatim in that way, but there are several biblical principles that point to this concept. And I want to share four with you. First, the first thing I want to share with you, that practicing his presence starts with seeking God's presence. If we're not looking for it, we can't find it. You know, if you don't know what you're looking for, how are you going to find it, right? And throughout the Bible, individuals are encouraged to seek God in his presence earnestly. (coughs) Psalm 105.4 says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. See, this verse reflects the idea of actively desiring and pursuing a close relationship with God. How many married people in the house? All right? Now, do you... Go to bed, wake up, say hi to your spouse, and then don't talk to them until you do it again? No. You active, well, if you do, (laughs) shame on you. You actively seek relationship. You actively seek to be with them and to, to be in their presence. So it's an active pursuit that we have to take to develop this close relationship with God. Number two, drawing near to God. This is a result of seeking God. Like when you draw near to somebody, you get closer. You spend time with them, you get closer. Think about your best friend. Did you just meet them? No, you've been spending time with them. You've been developing that relationship. And the New Testament encourages believers to draw near to God and experience his presence. James 4, 8, draw close to God and he'll draw close to you, right? This verse emphasizes the reciprocal nature. There's a reciprocal nature of seeking God. This indicates that we approach him. He responds by making himself known, so on, so on. The more we do that as a lifestyle, the more apt we are in. Number three, living in awareness of God's presence. You ever been um, somewhere, you're like doing something mundane and you're kind of in your own world, and then someone quietly like comes up behind you, like, oh, you scared me, you were shocked. You didn't know that they were in your presence, right? And sometimes, as believers, we find ourselves in this situation where we're not actively aware that God is always present. We have to realize that God is always present. He's always present. But we have to be seeking him. We have to be aware that he's here. You know, even as a 40 eight-year-old man, when I get around my grandmother, you know, I recognize, you know, and of course, nothing out of the um, ordinary to be polite to your grandmother, but when my grandmother's around, my my tone and my voice lowers, you know, (laughs) you know, I'm more aware to her and sensitive to her needs, you know, I listen, you know, to what she's saying on bated breath. And that's an example. We all have examples of people like that in our lives. When, when they're around, you know, we take notice. We stand up. We represent. And God is always around. He's worthy of us taking notice, standing up, and representing. Amen? You see, as believers, we are encouraged to cultivate this ongoing awareness in the presence of God in our lives. And this awareness We know it can be fostered through prayer, meditation, scripture, worship, and a lifestyle characterized by obedience and surrender to God. Surrender to God. Surrender to God. That's one of those words that, you know, we'd like another translation. (laughs) Surrender. You know, you've heard the term, Jesus, take the wheel. We have to allow Jesus to take the wheel. And that's where the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that power that Miss Valerie referred to, 
We can't do it in our own accord because in our own stubborn heads and, 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 and sinful minds and hearts, we want to do what we want to do. But because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we have the power to be led by the Spirit. You see, this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. And for Christians, the Holy Spirit dwells in us because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And this indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, it enables us to experience constant communion with God. Constant communion with God. You know, there's a joke um, that I shared a few weeks ago when I preached that, you know, my kids are God of North and woo! <laughs> I was so happy. And, and not that I don't like my kids, but, you know, even the best of people, you know, sometimes it'd be too much of a good thing, right? <laughs> too much of a good thing, you know? You know, like, give me a little break, you know? I, I, I need to, like, reset and we can re-engage. But not so with the presence of God. Pastor, you talked about it. We can't, we can't have I enough of God, you know, his, his, he is, you know, his grace is sufficient and, and we'll always be satisfied, but we'll never have enough of God. We always can have more and more and we'll never have too much of God. <laughs> Imagine that. Not so with God. His presence, continually communing with him is something that should be the desire and the aim of each of us as believers. We read in John um, 14, 6 through 17 that Jesus wanted his disciples to connect with the Holy Spirit and for the Holy Spirit to, to be with them forever. Why? Because the Holy Spirit enables believers to have that personal relationship with God, that personal relationship with God. Imagine if you were friends with a person that spoke Russian and you never saw them. And you didn't know anything about them. And you were asked to develop a relationship. How successful do you think you would be? And I'm assuming you don't speak Russian. Not very successful. And without the Holy Spirit, we can't have a rich, earnest, deep relationship with God. That's why we need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to be able to accomplish this. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He develops a relationship with God through guiding us, comforting us, and transforming us into that new person. Now, I want to share a short portion of a song. This song highlights the powerful pleasure of the presence of God more eloquently than I can. <clears throat> Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. That's just a cue for the media to play the video. is heaven and one day all the tears will be wiped away we won't have to deal with any of this anymore and that's a future glory when we receive for full measure of what we've been promised 
But even now, we can embrace that. We can possess what has been gifted to us. You know, I want to leave us with this. Many times we end up presenting objections to our Christian growth or asking all these questions when really we should be looking for the solutions and the answers. And the place that we find those solutions and those answers is in the presence of God. Amen. God bless you all and just continue to be in his magnificent presence. Amen. Thank you for that message, Pastor Marlon. Wow. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. Thank you, Jesus. Well, church, I do have a couple of announcements for you. Um, our first one is that next Sunday, July 23rd, we will be ordaining Michael Brown as the pastor of this church. Please give it up. So I want to see you, your moms, your dads, your children here so that we can participate in what the Lord is doing here at Grace Christian Family Church um, and just support Michael Brown as he takes the next step in, in his journey as a pastor. All right. And also, I have one more announcement. Um, if you or your mom or your dad are interested in joining the praise and worship team, today after church, I'm going to have a very quick meeting, like five minutes, maybe ten. And so if you're interested, please stay after church or just see me if you can't stay. Um, I can give you my phone number. But if you're interested in um, helping lead worship and really just cultivating the Holy Spirit here, let me know. All right, church, those are my only announcements. As a reminder, as I do every Sunday, stay in community. We need each other, and we need Jesus. Call a friend, call a neighbor. Remind them that the Lord is near and that his presence is so good. All right, please stand. Father God, Lord, I thank you so much for what you are doing here. God, I thank you for your presence, that it is so present that we get to experience it on a daily basis. God, as we go throughout our week, remind us that you are near. God, help us remain in your presence. Help us stay where you are. Lord, I thank you for your protection. I thank you for your guidance and your provision in our life. God, we see what you are doing. We are excited for all that you have for us. And God, we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In your name I pray. Amen. Have an amazing Sunday.